Right, so yeah, we have our track three roundtable discussion now. Um, and, you know, a lot of the topics happening in this track overall have to do with loop calculations. And this is a little bit um, a discussion about where we stand and um, if more thinking needs to happen about how to make um, results from higher order calculations available for people to use, especially the experimental community. Um, traditionally, the gold standard for loop calculations has always been to do things analytically because that's fast and you can easily put it in an event generator. But uh, there are other considerations as well, and even actually considering one loop calculations, most of the automated tools now use a more semi uh, numerical approach using um, the unitarity based methods. And if we go beyond actual leading order to two, three, and four loop level, you know, there are all kinds of different techniques that are being used, analytical or numerical. They have advantages and disadvantages for different applications. And so, yeah, we have a panel of four experts here uh, who will start off um, giving a short statement of, uh, you know, ideas and thoughts they have on the topic, and then, you know, we kind of want to open it up for discussion to the audience as well, and, um, you know, see where we end up with. So, yeah, can I invite, we have uh, Stephen Jones, Walter Thaler, uh, Yoshi Kato, and Takahiro Ueda. And I don't know, who of you wants to go first? <laughs> and my well, slides happens to be on the screen. So Your slides are already on the screen. Okay. Oops. Where do you go? <laughs> you don't want to sit centrally. I'm to change now. idea. <laughs> was working a minute ago. Now it's not working anymore. What's the problem? I don't know. The Acrobat disappeared. I mean, the if you screen? just bring your mouse to the left. Oh. No, no. We, had, we just activated one second for other position. Yeah. Well, well, that's what I'm trying to do. Oh, ah. now it does it. Okay, yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so I, I'll just start off by uh, making a bit of an opening statement and give some ideas for open to discussion, please just chime in and uh, let me know what you think. But I start off with uh, thinking about the motivation. I, I think we, we need to think why we're doing these loop calculations to know the best way to do them. But the first thing, um, one reason that we could uh, choose to do these calculations is that we want to essentially provide a null hypothesis for our experimental colleagues. So here what we're doing is a standard model calculation, for example, and we're just trying to give them the best possible prediction that we can of what they'll see if there's nothing out there, nothing of interest out there. And for example, to fulfill this goal, it means that they need access to that result. It means, it means that they need to easily be able to plug that into their analysis framework. If we think more about BSM, then we could be providing information that they can use to optimize their experimental searches. Um, or to interpret the data in terms of a theory constraint. So there we might be kind of looking at their data and seeing what that imposes on our model. And for that, maybe we need a, a lower level of accuracy just to get a rough idea of what constraints are. But in some situations, maybe we need also very high accuracy. We might also do them just to understand the structure of quantum field theory. So maybe we want to look at the anomalous dimension of the beta functions, identify hidden symmetries within the theories, or uh, to understand connections between renormalization schemes, for example. Or we might just do them because we love maths and uh, maybe we like to be purists and um, understand the structure of our problem. Uh, yes, so I think that's, that would be his comment, probably. <laughs> so, um, here I, I give a bit of a, a table, it's a bit subjective of course, where I just compare some of the features and where I think the strengths and the weaknesses of the two methods are. So we could want to know, do we have exact whole calculation, like 
is it easy to check our results and, and identify inconsistencies in the way we compute the things. And analytically, I think typically that's something that we do have. This is a very much a strong point. Whereas with a numerical calculation, we can never be absolutely sure. We can just say how many digits the polls cancel to. We might be interested in fact evaluation, and at least up until now, we've always been able to find function classes that are quick to numerically evaluate. And so it's been possible to make very quick analytic calculations. And I think it's uh, It'll be interesting to see how we go in the coming years as we enter maybe new function classes that maybe have different performance or behave differently, and to see how well we can understand them and accelerate them. Numerically, this is where we tend to suffer because we tend to use some Monte Carlo integration techniques or things like this that take a long time to because high accuracy. Okay. Um, so, you know, Advanced evaluation, do we have a technical definition of what it means for advanced evaluation, or is it just a subjective? As I said, it's highly, highly, highly subjective. Okay. Um, so maybe we, it might be good to like uh, say that, okay, advanced evaluation is something that scales like you know, faster than such and such. So I think you will have to get what we need to have. Um, okay. This would be based on uh, analytic results for the oh, right. elements. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like just, yeah. be, just for the sheer number of base base points. Aliens. Yeah. 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 Only there you want more and more calories in black box, and you want this uh, result and also uncertainty. It doesn't really matter how big the uncertainty is, as long as it's well estimated. This may be actually <laughs> an important point to discuss, so why don't we hold it in our minds yeah. for yeah. after yeah. we have made the statement? That line in my table. Okay. And <laughs> okay. this is controversial. <laughs> okay. So um, we might also want to know. Um, where are our integral singularities? Um, exactly how are our functions behaving? Do we see any thresholds in these functions and so forth? And the analytic results usually provide this to us, whereas numerically it's just difficult to obtain. Then moving to two points that I think currently num numeric uh, approaches have the advantage with. We could look at extensions to more scales. And here, analytically, this is traditionally a very difficult problem, and there have been some pretty remarkable breakthroughs, maybe some of them we mentioned by my colleagues, that have made, made this possible to, to keep pushing forward with this analytic program. But it's difficult, and it takes a lot of very smart people to come up with these. Whereas numerically, it tends to be less difficult. It can usually be phrased in terms of some kind of computing problem, and it's a matter of time. And of course, there are many developments here that can accelerate these things. But it's usually not, in principle, a problem. Also, with automation, with analytic calculations, the methods tend to evolve and quite dramatically change, and there are many different methods. This is also true of numerical methods, but often it's my impression that these methods are maybe a little bit more widely applicable. They're a bit more of a, a black box, a bit of a brute force approach, and this makes automation easier. Okay, and I just want to maybe highlight three calculations that I think are sort of interesting because they actually sort of straddle the line between analytic and numeric computation. So we have, of course, the top quark pair production. And here, part of the calculation is done analytically. So essentially, the integral reduction is done using the Laporte algorithm. But the integrals are solved numerically using very nice um, numerical solution of differential equations which requires some handwork to work out the boundary conditions, and then can uh, be used to numerically uh, solve these differential equations. 
There's also the for loop MS bar on shell um, for normalization scheme uh, of the clock mask um, in QCD and general SUN. And here again, um, multiple methods were used for the integral reduction, analytic uh, methods, fire and crusher. And for the integrals, some of them were computed fully analytically. Some were computed using Mellon Barnes, which required some handwork and some numerical integration. And then the remaining integrals were computed using set to decomposition with the ESA. So this shows really the combined approach of just attacking the integrals with the most appropriate method at hand today. And then um, there's our calculation, which I spoke about, but the integrals were computed numerically. And again, reduction is, is the one. So we analytically manipulate things before we try to uh, perform these integrals. And just to highlight one really interesting development from my perspective is that sometimes these analytic insights can really help with the numerics. So one observation is that it's always possible to take a finite basis of integrals. So that means they don't have one of epsilon divergences. They're pulled out into the coefficients of these integrals. And then rewrite these integrals, uh, rewrite all the integrals in the problem using dimension shifts and dots in terms of this finite basis. And there's this very nice study of two, uh, two loop mixed electroweak QCD corrections, Trellian by uh, Andreas and Montpoto and Robert Schadinger, where they just took a conventional integral basis, just run your Laporte algorithm and see what integrals it spits out with your lexographic ordering. And what they see is there are some killer integrals for the numerics that just take ridiculous amounts of time and they don't really converge. And you have a huge problem here trying to apply the numerical approach. But if they rotate to a different basis, which amounts to basically taking different master integrals, which is something you can easily do, maybe it takes some compute time. The times drop dramatically. And the most important point is that the really tough integrals become absolutely attackable with this method. So there's a huge decrease in the times numerically integrated. OK, so in summary, I think that uh, in defense of numerical results, I think that they're relatively robust and somewhat automatable. Existing algorithms can deal with many different loops and legs and scales with limited human input. Of course, there are always cases where it's incredibly difficult, and we pay for this in compute time. They allow us to explore beyond where we can easily calculate analytically. And the techniques are evolving. These are not just old techniques being applied again and again and again. So see the talks already at this conference. But we saw, for example, the, the QMC, which I think is a very important development in, uh, in the numerical approach here. Um, and they're capable of achieving um, some of the goals outlined in my motivation. And sometimes they need a bit of help with doing that, for example, constructing grids so that we can interface for the Monte Carlo generator. And they can benefit from the analytic insights. <laughs> I think the verses or something is, is that in the title or is that in my title? I don't know. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So I don't I don't think it's really a choice. I think that it's going to come whether we like it or not. So unless we find a new part tomorrow or the next year or so, the transition is going to be the name of the game and then there will be such a push. But imagine you have a linear radical, you know, imagine I mean None of these are precision observations is currently prepared or our theoretical position is nowhere close to what the linear polarity position is. So, so immediately we'll be faced with the sort of uh, having soon to calculate a much, much more precise result. Mm -hmm. So what I believe is going to happen within the next five or ten years that the methods of invention also the methods of human intervention. Are going to become refined in such a way that at the end it will be possible to focus on publications and say, I want this and this to be done because it's there on the limitations mm -hmm. and I estimate this to be something that needs to be covered. Mm -hmm. I need money and funding to go to some big computer center and buy so and so many hours of compute time. I mean, and then it's going to be a scalable problem because you can't have that there are some experiments to be done to do all the, the analytic calculations for you in the time that you need it. Maybe the geneticists will help us. <laughs> <laughs> I discussed this virus before, so um, I guess machine learning would be fantastic if you could somehow, by looking at the images that we have, sort of extrapolate to the ones we don't have, but I, I don't see this coming up. I mean, it's not like you can learn from what you should have an excellent learning. Well, 
why don't we hear for some of the people who work on the analytic front? <laughs> uh, who wants okay. to go next? Oh, well, yeah. Are you sure. Okay. Oh. So, yeah. Stephen uh, made good, uh, made, I just made an argument on the good review, so, but I just want to say something. So, so analytical purpose in the makeup world, there are many numerical methods for that static condition, or you can have some non-integral, or are you using the differential equation, or the computational method, or could be uh, some personalization for an Well, so next. And uh, well, from this method, I, I thought that maybe I was expected to say something about the analytical method. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but well, analytical method would be. Uh, anyway, so I want to, so I will go for the maximum analytical way as far. So, sometimes I was told that the any good material can be expressed by some kind of a uh, really generalized uh, hyperbolic function, which is uh, from the uh, by Hilfaut, Dry, Derek, and T. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to but anyway. Can I ask you who told, who mm -hmm. told you that? Uh, was it one of these people? Uh, <laughs> yeah, like a handful. My brother is probably the one with the condition. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> anyway, and uh, yeah, so later I was thinking, okay, maybe this could be uh, what I can say. So I was, I was starting reading some newspaper, and I still also have that. I'm not sure about how it works. Anyway, so I think it's a kind of uh, yeah, by a fine man visualization or a fine visualization, which can be fit in the very general uh, the so that means one or okay, someday, uh, someone or some company or work to implement such a function and, and also it's not expansion and also some numerical method you know how to evaluate numerical evaluate such things. Sorry, this is a science fiction. But anyway, once this is done, okay, everything will be done. <laughs> So this is a lot of But in the reality, okay, this is not the case. So reality is uh, currently uh, also implemented up to the multiple periodization. So uh, yeah, you can see um, if you type this command then do something like that. That's that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. So <laughs> now it's a <laughs> So, yeah, still we have jobs. <laughs> 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 so, well, okay, anyway, the analytical method means that, well, we need to tran translate or well, uh, compute some quantity to the normal function. So, normal function, which uh, we know how to remember the evaluate. So, uh, how can we do that? So, in this, I think that this two decades or the 1970s, uh, uh, so, yeah, in this, in this case, many programs have been successfully solved with the uh, uh, development or, yeah, uh, yeah, development or study of the harmonic and multiple polyols. So, such a type of uh, function are used for the Writing a solution of the integral or yeah, many processes. Now, what could be the next one? So, one thing I I have in my mind is that uh, okay, I use the uh, area, <laughs> and uh, if I cut this one, so uh, must be a uh, hundred too. So then, actually, well, in this area, recent year, so. Another kind of uh, yeah, generalization, uh, generalization appears for such a basis. 
So this is a beyond the uh, multiple polyline. So I want, I was just wondering if it could be the next. Okay. Actually, I have no idea or answer. So I want to know the senior people's opinion that uh, this could be the next thing for in, in a five years or ten years. We should uh, consider or not. But maybe other, other kind of uh, function. I'm not sure. And uh, another thing, okay, another thing, what I, I have to say, uh, or I do that I was correct, is a kind of uh, what could be uh, done from the machine learning or deep learning for the high mind data. So uh, if you, you saw that the uh, main presentation was done in, with, uh, in the machine learning or deep learning, in this compound. So, well, so maybe someone started to consider such some application. I'm not sure, but, but well, so the speculative well, this could, idea could be uh, machine learning also for the finance. So, well, okay, I just say one example. I'm not sure, but like, uh, let's say that we have uh, integration by star reduction problem. So, it's a kind of a uh, uh, we need to consider three uh, 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 a good linear combination. There will be many com linear combination that are equation, and from this from this uh, equation, we need to do some kind of the IEP mining IOP. It's not that data mining, mining but so digging the many combination to find a good linear combination which really reduce the integral. Well, Elegantly or with a high speed. So, okay, this, this is just uh, what I want to say so, as a starting point. Okay. Who wants to go next? In the middle, the middle. All right. Oh, this is fine. Okay, good, good. Okay, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, we'd like to solve to compute the high order corrections uh, for our uh, friend experiments. It was very hard to provide us uh, uh, very uh, good data. So, and uh, in this workshop, uh, we presented to the PCM uh, method, which is a uh, uh, hip hop. We don't copy the maximally uh, numerically. Uh, it's a combination of the uh, integral numerically and also the next uh, extrapolation <coughs> to take the limits. And already uh, we have, I have made the talk the day before yesterday, and also today uh, in the session, uh, Daisal can say something about also related to talk about the And uh, <coughs> as as I explained yesterday before, uh, if, uh, if uh, the target function is, uh, can be expressed as a row of the, uh, the epsilon, then we can co compute these questions with the separating terms directly. And uh, related to this, I would like to uh, introduce you to some recent to, uh, Japanese uh, <coughs> Uh, accomplishment. Uh, this is uh, related to the mu g minus two, two full electric collections uh, done by Nakazawa, Ishikawa, Yasui. And uh, this work originally uh, started in 1995, two years before. Uh, do you remember that? Uh, the first report uh, by Mr. Nakazawa was done as a uh, PISA AI hemp workshop. Of course, this APRT is a, a series workshop sequence success of the uh, air hemp, so uh, this place is very uh, appropriate to uh, introduce this, uh, this stories. However, uh, after this, uh, Mr. Nakazawa uh, is involved with the non physics matter very much, so uh, the research is uh, somehow terminated. However, uh, after his retirement, he resumed the research and then uh, recently, uh, these, these, guys, these guys uh, almost finished their computations, and uh, 
uh, almost the uh, now preparing the final paper and uh, to present the results. Uh, I mean, uh, you know that uh, this is a table of the uh, G minus <coughs> status, reasonably uh, uh, expanded value and the self value. And the electron to loop is uh, there are several uh, references here. Uh, it's uh, coded to be the minus 441.2. And they are almost ready to uh, <coughs> Uh, present a new value for this. Uh, uh, it's not that it's very, very pretty only, but uh, the result is similar to this one, but not completely the same. Right? I don't know, but it's not very clear at this moment. Anyway, so it's almost uh, uh, just before release. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, <coughs> Starting point is uh, always is the automated system grace, and the grace uh, generates uh, diagrams. Uh, in this case, we use uh, the energy non non gauge fixing model to use. So uh, we have uh, some of, uh, this number of the two diagrams and two seventy uh, counter terms, and then we have computed these stuff uh, in automatic manner, and then uh, of course. Uh, <coughs> In automatic computation, uh, how we can believe our result is true or not? So uh, they make very hard. They work very hard to uh, check the results, uh, doing some such uh, cancellation mechanisms and also the uh, gauge invariance mechanism and other stuff. Okay. So and they have three checks the results and, uh, <coughs> uh, and the <coughs> research is at the final stage and almost finished finishing. Um, but uh, what I will say is that uh, uh, the <laughs> the detailed result of these things are uh, should please wait to their paper. Uh, it will come in soon. But uh, according to here, I would like to say that in course of this uh, research uh, to calculate these huge numbers of Feynman diagrams, they have found that uh, <coughs> this uh, extrapolation method is uh, very uh, appropriate for also for their purposes. Uh, it, in the course of the, these calculations, they tried both both things. Uh, first is conventional analytic method to separate the uh, ultra parallel poles from the final terms uh, to, to, uh, to rearrange the uh, uh, symbolic terms uh, by hand. And also, uh, they uh, used this uh, numerical extrapolation method. And the final, the final conclusion is that the numerical extrapolation method is better than the uh, analytic handling. Uh, to avoid uh, complicated lengthy formulas and also uh, to avoid uh, human errors. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, there is uh, the condition that uh, if one can say that the numerical expression is better, uh, it means uh, some uh, integrals can be done with high accuracy. Uh, they are doing this uh, uh, high accuracy integration using the double exponentiation method. Uh, so that is, this is. Uh, uh, what, what I would like to say related to the uh, subject of this uh, round table discussions. And finally, uh, related to uh, uh, machine learning or artificial intelligences, uh, I would like to say some more for the uh, uh, a short, a short point of these extrapolations. Uh, as I said before, uh, that, that we prepare a set of the series of the efficient values and make integrations get the series of the uh, integration values. And then we, make, we estimate the uh, <coughs> quotient using some algorithm extrapolations. One is uh, Wayne's algorithm, another is linear solver for macro linear equations. However, uh, in the conventional cases, uh, such a limiting process, if we calculate time by time, 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 then if number of time calculate time is uh, larger, then the accuracy is was going to be uh, good in normally. But however, in this case, it's not always true. Uh, rather, we must stop at somewhere. Uh, for, for instance, uh, this wind algorithm, uh, if we apply this uh, to some uh, function uh, like this, then uh, that, that wind algorithm is uh, if the uh, series is given in this formula, then it will, it will pick up this only the constant terms and killing this side of side of and both sides. Both sides are killed by this uh, uh, <coughs> equivalence relations. 
the secret is this, this work, uh, subtracting and taking inverse. However, if you can easily understand that if uh, the terms reach to the, the same values, then this, this term is 1 over 0, so, this is, so we must stop before it, it completely reaches to zero. So, uh, we need some appropriate number, uh, number to compute the series, and this uh, selection of this is not very uh, well, uh, at this moment, is not very fixed, and uh, to control these uh, extrapolations, uh, maybe uh, such a <coughs> Actually, intelligent or machine learning system such as such as things can, can be helpful for our uh, development. I see. So Thank you. And Walter, you didn't have any slides, right? No. 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 It's up to you. <laughs> So, so I come from more from uh, from Carlos perspective where you really want to write software which in the end we're going to hand over to the analysis. But we use it in all kinds of cases you will never imagine. So we want a very robust program that we have somewhat contest against all kinds of uh, unexpected uh, use. Um, this puts some constraints in it. Also you don't want Use all kinds of exotic uh, hardware and external data. But habits, clusters, you want to hijack the whole CMS security. And for your compiler, the Daniel's idea of this uh, end topics for another uh, role, is that in your set? And you decided to write it for the. Because then you get to run the program and you want to give away the data. <laughs> Yes, but that, that means you will be very busy with that. Yes. Things change, they want to change. Mm -hmm. Also, handing over your code to the public means that other people, other peers will use it. Katani and WPP, the fact you see today, you will say to actually that, move to the state page, handing over your code. Helps not only experimental, but also no, I think. it's like writing a paper. The code should also be there for other people to just look at as they see. They don't go uh, as they handle. They're the same. They will import code from other people. I, I, I am for, I, I'm very open source in that. Yeah. If, if you think of what your restriction of this, uh, is not good. Right. I'm happy to have that, but I will also hand over the code. So yeah, uh, sure. Experiment is not hand over. Yeah, yeah, but you can also raise the point that if you are going the universe, uh, the availability of the code, so there are many private codes, you know, things that people would take out of them, but because I can understand that they don't make it public, if they, they, if I make it public, then I have to share it with my company support. And, Yeah. 
Year, it's deploying more and more features. This makes it easier to program the GPUs. 
And so you think at some point the GPU packages will just catch up to this point where it's a few line changes in MTFM. Just telling it when it's not it really share its memory and not. You really have to think about yeah. it. How, how, how memory is used. <laughs> For example, <laughs> of, of data from is but for example, in the, in the later sections of CUDA, they have also um, like a, a, a model where the, the memory can be accessed both from the CPU and from the GPU, and the compiler essentially decides when it should be shipped across the board. Mm -hmm. So it, it sort of sees you accessing a set, set of memory a lot if it ships it across. So maybe there's not perfect scaling. Mm -hmm. But if you structure your calls such that it's just kind of evaluating the tree level, yeah. building the work, you know, maybe things like this. The yeah. alternative has to explore. Okay. Uh, okay. If, uh, <laughs> if people would use it. Right, okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> it yeah. must depend to some extent on how you call them, right? Yes. I, mean, yeah. I, I don't think the C compiler can. It's not so like right. on CPU where you don't really think about the underlying hardware architecture. Right. You need to more. Still, you have to think about maybe in the cloud future, it's all hidden for you and so the file is beautiful.
maybe it, it, these regions where you lose numerical accuracy actually are not so important right, in the radio. So, 10 years ago, I would have paid this effect. Yeah, so a lot of those interactions. So, the, the problem with that is analytically complicated. Yeah, the, the, the algorithm is very complex. I know. Uh, nowadays, you <laughs> transfer it to, <laughs> to multi tally. So, yeah. you really favor simple algorithms. Yes. And slicing is extremely simple. Yeah. Throw it together in a day, mm -hmm. run it, and it will work. Also, it was a little more friendly, it's not one of the calculations. Now then, of course, you're first with the uh, slice code. Yeah. Now, uh, last year, people like, are figuring out how to calculate the power of this. Yes. So now, once you get to a formulated method, systematically calculate term after term, then you sort of get an exact basic integration in the series of arbitrary. Yeah. So that's sort of where we hope it's going to. So that you're not pushing the right. results in the So, for instance, you do yeah. slice it of 10 GED, you have an error of 10 to minus 6. Yes. And you just, you know how many terms you have to calculate. It will be a hard calculation. But calculating that is like that. Calculated for fishes of power breaks and then. I don't know much about how these are able to calculate it. Me they come from the effect of the field theory. But are they, are they, are they ultimately being computed numerically themselves? No. Or that they're being sort of fundamental? Well, in case specific, it means trying to do it on a different So, So the calculated coefficient is, again, there's an imagine that are intervals there which you can calculate that they are. Just one parameter, among parameters, to calculate and tabulate it and don't be calculated in the interval. So, sure, they just tell you the number, how it needed it if you want this. Of course, they, uh, these terms will be process, uh, processed at higher. First power correction is almost one process, but the higher one is more one process. And they sort of be the uh, so you start with the level and then you have all these terms and then you build a level plus one to an power extent. And is it, is it wild to envision programmable animation in the cloud? I think that's way too early. I mean, it's very early, yes. right? Because you don't have to. There are two pages on it and they demonstrate they can calculate the first power extent. Yeah. This probably will open up, hopefully, in the open so, and so when developing all, all the methods, so we uh, should, of course, uh, also remember about many things that have been done, I mean, in the 80s, in the 90s, and there are uh, many results uh, which uh, can be used, uh, for example, as some special results to compare uh, more general uh, results, uh, say, for more general masses, momenta, whatever. Uh, and, um, for example, uh, Walter, you spoke about asymptotic expansions or right. whatever. Uh, so, for example, there are many results for um, two-loop two and three-loop diagrams, uh, asymptotic expansions for small momentum, for large momentum, and even asymptotic expansions around pseudo thresholds, around mm -hmm. thresholds, and so on. And if we develop, I mean, some numerical or semi-analytical methods, so it would be good to compare. And for certain calculations, it's maybe okay to take, I mean, four or five day terms of a synthetic expansion, and it will work. Mm -hmm. But the point is that, I mean, every year, I mean, we get hundreds of new papers and whatever, and we tend to forget uh, what was 10 years ago or yes, 20 years ago. Yes, we Right. That's why we need to be here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 That's exactly what I was coming to. So we, need, we actually need uh, things like Wikipedia, whatever, uh, to store this information where we click on the topology of the diagram and where we get, I mean, maybe 20 or 25 papers, but we can, if you look through the papers and we can look through the comments for each special cases, uh, 
uh, it works and um, and so on. So and this would be indeed the interplay between the numerical methods and the analytical methods because uh, these asymptotic expansions, so the coefficients of asymptotic expansions are analytic functions, like in the vacuum diagrams or whatever. And uh, so asymptotic expansion is constructed analytically, even though I mean when you uh, take many terms, so it still gives you a numerical result. But um, I mean, the things, in my opinion, are important. So we we just uh, we just need such that databases like Thomas. I mean, I think for what you want, I think would like to have what is now available at what the process of being for the data was. Don't have to care about. They they just check are you in this limit, and then they go on to do some expansion or whatever it needs to to get a precision or Then maybe they make a check, and if the check fails, yeah. So, I mean, of course, we're not there yet, and for any group, I don't see that we're going to get there anytime soon, but I mean, that would be so better than a database here would be a program that, you know, would be blood and master and people, and then either it can start with the can't do that at all, or I can give you a numerical approximation according to whatever uh, algorithm, or it has some asymptotic expansion that you can choose after it takes. So, so far. I mean, this is going to be uh, an afterword. So, so. Yeah. I, I Thinking along the ten, this is something that we're very interested in. You could almost imagine a loop generator where you type a process, it finds the integrals it needs, then it goes to some database to see do these things exist analytically, and where they don't, it calls numerical routines. This would be the dream situation, right? Although I sometimes also wonder, you know, I mean, if we invest a lot of manpower and brain power in making things automatized, in some sense we are not investing that power into actually pushing the envelope of what we can actually calculate, right? I mean, it's, um, some of those ideas, you know, they were just floated some very ambitious in terms of automatization, uh, something we should be pursuing with priority. <laughs> I think it's very easy to, um, to think that you're making lots of progress coming up with very smart automated solutions, but the acid test is can you actually compute something we're interested in, right? right? And so personally, I, I don't see a way around the kind of process driven about where you think, okay, can we push the envelope to things beyond which we can currently compute, but try to do so in a way where we can reuse the tools that we build. So, yeah. Well, I think, okay, so to answer your question, I think you have to have in mind who your audience is going to be. So who is actually going to be using this optimal tool? Will it be other developers of algorithms? Calculations, or are these going to be people on the outside who are actually more leaning towards the phenomenologist side? Right? They're not so much uh, focused on trying to figure out which algorithm to use and which method to technique to use and where they would appreciate something quite possible. I think uh, for people in that community, they would really appreciate something where they don't have to. Uh, no, I mean, certainly people would appreciate it, but. It's the time of those people that get saved by the program mm -hmm. more than the time, say, I'm the one developing it, invested in making it. And I, can I quote you also, Master, with this? Uh, he, he, we were once discussing over the now, so I think um, occasionally I also do some book calculations that I used to for in my earlier life, but I've discovered that I'm much better at developing for him. I also think that also other people are much better served by me developing for the best possible way. Uh, lots of group calculations that, you know, I don't find that exciting that it's good out of the and then propagating the bits into the format or so. But I guess you want to have hope. If you think about the problem with me, I think there are a lot of automatic tools that were unthinkable a decade or two ago, yeah? I mean, the Python generation when I started out, this is a problem today, you say just about to that. And, and there are many things like that, so I... Oh, yeah, the the I, I'm not... I mean, yeah, I mean, it's also a question, you know, 
if there is a new everything needs to be automatized. Um, I, I bet that uh, Steve and Wolf from, and other progenitors of the UCS uh, developers must have asked exactly this sort of question years and years ago. Now, of course, they were not doing something that specialized in something for high energy physics or something like that. But you can see uh, what came out of it. Yeah. And you can see that even the professional researchers find it very, very useful. And I do think, I think the answer to your question is affirmative. Yes, they actually, it is. Actually, in Mathematica, they put it high energy physics stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all the secret functions are getting ready to put it out, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 I think also if you have a big calculation that involves many, many diagrams, then you need calculations. Yeah, on yeah. that level, I think we all agree. Yeah. Obviously, nobody is, you know, going through diagrams one by one. That's, that's, that's not happening. But also, but to, to, for example, if you do these numerically, then you need to we need to get some information on what methods to use. Oh, yes. Numerically. But then there's, you know, I mean, there's still difference. Like, you know, for instance, I've worked many years of my career on group integrals, mostly numerical, but, you know, as, as Andre was saying, you know, sometimes you have limits where you rather want to find an analytical result. So you, you assemble some of those lists for yourself to some extent. Right, over time. And, you know, could spend some time putting all of that in a program that other people could be using. But it would only cost about two years of my time, and I wouldn't be doing any physics at that time. Well, that way it would be at least helpful if there was so a typical phenomenon that I've witnessed several times is that if I'm a, if we have a drawing student doing a calculation, we at the end. They, they publish a paper, they have wonderful thoughts, everything is there, but then they leave the field. And then the whole code languishes, and five years later, nobody can actually reproduce the numbers. So maybe yeah. somebody else did the calculation, they want to check with this guy, and okay, you have a plot, and you don't really know what the number of this plot was exactly. There. there is, and this is not the same kind of thing that you have when you compare a single place. They want to make sure that you have, I don't know what you have, just agreement with. And so, Sometimes it would be helpful to just have the whole thing with the doesn't, doesn't compile cleanly or so, so that you have a bit. So after that, I this was from the Woodsbrook School, one of the things that I took. Uh, he always put uh, a little section into his, so whenever they, they did the calculation, and I think they still do it today, uh, they, they put a box saying numerical inputs, and then they have all these you know, alpha to whatever position they took, and a lot of quark maps, and whatever they took. And then they give you a few, for a few base space points, they give you the actual numerical value. So if somebody wants to go and check the calculation, they can and really get to the very bottom of it, knowing exactly what the inputs were. Not such a bad idea if you think about it. Just that it's not very common. And also, few people want to let their code go, and everybody says, oh, what if somebody says, uh, they are going to steal my ideas, and they want to steal my code. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And that's exactly what Otto was saying. Right? Yeah. Reproducibility is, is a problem. Yeah. Uh, but it, there's a different problem, of course. So when you make a program that runs for a year and then gives you a result, uh, if anyone else wants to reproduce that, they also have to wait a year. Oh, that's so if you do the wrong account, yes, they can do it. So for what you it, it's different from them from solving analytical uh, uh, integrals where you could have made a mistake. So uh, I should be true, but I, what I would like to see, I mean, I think I was like, if you were back to 10 wrong, they were there, so it's easy to find you can put your plot and so on. But ultimately, there's a really a type where you really want to see, am I really doing the same type of way? Am I really using this? And of course, it's not going to be an integrated variable instead of the But the time you throw in on the screen, you will not see them. This is the choice. If you just, the, the, I mean, of course, the, the, the plot is something different, and the plot conveys this. But I agree that this is uh, like what we do. We have some smaller checks that people can do. The fact that they, uh, uh, and maybe this is also some of the journals of you. They like include something in the paper that can be, uh, can be checked. Oh, yeah, I mean, not that, but I, I always put my numerical input. Put it at 
as an attachment to a computer readable text file that just needs to be Okay. Coming back to the issue of complete organization, so that's sort of outside of the program. Uh, well, are we there yet? So I, I didn't do the medical stuff, so I don't know. But if you, if the, the programs now, how we, how much uh, uh, manual work is uh, going on? I, I, I Yeah, I think it's out the Monte Carlo because the, the infinite 
as the format is the same, and, and you can just share it easily on the video, for example, in this format, and people will be able to use it. So this would require for, for every component, it would require to provide, well, first agree on sort of the specification, and then uh, implement it if there is a possible uh, output format. To some extent, wasn't fine count by trying to uh, provide such an overarching thing that other people could plug in their their phones, or was that a different? Was fine, did fine count have a different mission? I, I don't know. Fine, well, fine count does it on the on the analytical logic side, so, yeah. But it, I think you know what Ben is thinking about, and you know this would actually, to some extent, even address what we talked earlier. You know, having a package like uh, like um, the Collier library for the one loop case for higher loops. And uh, I think that idea would be instead of having one big package that does everything, you have you have a, a language that defines which specifies a certain integral, and there can be you know hundreds of different modules written by different authors all over the world. Mm -hmm. and you can basically take any of those, and you know you you, you type in 15 integrals, and you know you find the five different modules that do that, and. Uh, it would be easy for them to tie them into your project because they all use the same interface language. Well, I think for one, they're not so far away as in the The only functions and arguments that are actually large here to the point. Just doing that and just learning and all of us. So there's not no real. This, this is where I think things dramatically change. So, Yes, yeah, because there's nothing like a yes. standard integral beyond <laughs> one. Exactly. Means. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. For one of the cases, it's basically for. I think the whole concept integral is because very much. But. So is it? So it is true that um, no one has come up with some sort of standardized ordering of arguments for multi loop interpolation. Well, I mean, it's a, it's. I think it's, it's a bigger problem than that, even, mm -hmm. which is. You don't even know what the basic integrals mm -hmm. are. Well, you know, like for example, I think, I think we the graph basic right. problem. We're, we're not really interested in um, the canonical basis, but any arbitrary loop integral um, couldn't, couldn't be posed the question of how to standardize that as a graph theoretic. I mean, maybe for scalar intervals, which is purely graphs with no numerator. Yeah, but then you have arbitrary numerators. Yes, that maybe you have to be inverse propagated. Maybe you well, have you one. Still do that. Yeah, so there are graph implementations for that as well. Yeah. 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 Well, you can just denominalize those. Yeah. Well. And then you can even put in it. What do you mean? Within that propagated system? Or with arbitrary tens and numerators? Arbitrary tenses is also okay. Yeah. As a graph. Yeah. You would still have to do some work because uh, yes. it's not unique. But there was so you have to come up with a way to do it. Sorry? You bring it into the form. Yeah. So that makes it easy. Well, yeah, you have to define what you're going to do. Yes. So I mean, that's it's not straightforward to define it. But, uh, no, but that's something you yeah. can agree on. So, well, yeah. I, I have in my, so like my, my own definition of what is a minimal, uh, minimal uh, isomorphism, mm -hmm. but that's something like that you can agree on in the specification. And I think that might be worth uh, pursuing, uh, standardizing things. I think that is something. Kind of yeah. In addition to that, of course, often people calculate complicated linear and uh, linear combinations of integral frames. Like the canonical basis doesn't typically say this integral is for this times this integral. It says this integral is this complicated linear function, and you maybe don't. Individually know each of those integrals, or maybe you could extract them. But, but I don't know. I think we're just I think the question is just taking one step back, and that is just how are you need to write down the symbolic form, of that, or how you refer to that integral. If you even want to write down such a relation, this integral equals a linear combination of this other set of integrals. Yeah. How do you refer to these integrals in a way that everyone would yeah. be able to? Like, uh, for example, you know our, our friend. The chemist's friends, they've already come up with a nice system Not to, to yeah. name their organic molecules that can be arbitrarily complicated, right? So what we need is some analogous thing that will be nice and bubble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> 
from what's well, our perspective, I don't think it's my decision. But some error on my Google search, so I had a scheme or whatever. The overall error of the uh, cross section would be less than 0.1%, probably. Also, there are many other sources of errors. It's a large. So it'd be very nice to have some sort of, <coughs> you know, Google search, and I just tell it. I want it up to 1% accuracy or 2% accuracy. And it might run much faster. It can just have to be very complicated. Does that work out for the function? It does for the intervals in our double case uh, calculation. Okay. We did precisely what you just described. We said we want the two amplitude yes. at this precision. That would be very and good. then what it does is a stratified sampling. So it adjusts how many points it's putting into the different <coughs> intervals to get you that accuracy in the shortest wall time that it can. Okay. So it also takes into account the time, like mm -hmm. a non planar yes. is yeah. at one point. It has a big impact. Is that it? I, I think this is an important. I mean, I'd say it's probably something like an order of magnitude in improvement than just sampling across the board and every interval until you get the accuracy of the point. Yeah, would be very interesting. <laughs> I'm glad it's not useless. <laughs> well, so now we've in the last minutes talked quite a bit about blue particles, but uh, earlier we had you know this discussion coming up about actually what did to do the real evaluation contributions, which I was wondering was saying sometimes uh, can can be more computing intensive than particles. Um, also, since they are much easier to parallelize, or to much easier to parallelize, right? And and there's so now basically still use Vegas technology. Thirty years. That's never been improved. Uh, so there's a recent paper by the past. Thirty years of improvement. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I didn't see that. Yet. What's the improvement? Um, so the idea is normally that you just spin along the axes with Vegas. But he has basically generalized that in a sort of obvious fashion that allows you to bin paper cubes. So you can, you're not just spinning along the axes and then it samples and you bin all the same. But if you're sampling, you're sort of drawing like two squares and then sampling like 50 dimensional space. So yeah. then you do the. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. So <laughs> the, the idea is you could basically just move the if you have two to the D region. But he just split it along two uh, directions. So the idea is that the almost the same area by mystery stars, they seem to be very close to what you would like. Because basically, a program probability can say you want to repeat the It has a multi dimensional function, and you just know where it's involved. And you want your random numbers to be generated according to the probability. Yeah. yeah. I mean, ideally, it's all close to the machine learning that I. Ideally, you don't want to work with bins at all, but somehow. Yes. And some continuous <laughs> adaptation. <laughs> but but like the, there should be something there that we we'll accidentally learn the Vegas algorithm and then <laughs> Yeah, no, I I think the yeah. so there was a paper in this direction applying machine learning to adapt to I don't remember the people of that and I also yeah. couldn't summarize what people that should be never really needed it was just for yeah, the next next we know is C comes in the that's initial business I think in principle a neural network should be quite capable of doing that. It's just a matter of how big of a neural network you would need in order to make a difference on top of the figures. I mean just fancy ways of thin functions, right? And it should be an ideal problem to yeah, think so I did that. Somebody I right? need to <laughs> hire somebody from track one or two. <laughs> Are you aware of anything like that? This is 
interesting, uh, I don't know, something might have seen that, um, that people came up with for actually identifying features in, in the data um, using Bogomoy tessellations. Somehow they are so these is that you know instead of having cubes you have you know polygons which yes. can have different shapes, different angles in the corners and so on. There are algorithms which you know if you have some multi-dimensional functions then they, they place them such that you know where the function actually does a lot of stuff, they are more of them, you know, smaller areas of things. Kind of smaller that's what we want. Yeah, there was some paper by the by the Florida group, you know, with Constantin Matchev and James A. People who were advocating using them for, you know, I mean, some of you might have heard, you know, if you have produced SUSI particles at the LHC because, you know, you miss some particles if they are stable, so you cannot reconstruct any bumps, but you can look for kinematic edges, right? But then, you know, sometimes if you have a complicated decay process, kinematic edge might not appear, you know, in the best way in some particular invariant mass, but it might appear in some weird variable that nobody thinks about. Or in some multidimensional space, you know, you have maybe, you know, some, some edge which has, you know, some curve in that space. And, you know, they were saying basically, you know, these ordinary Translation algorithms able to find those important regions yeah, where, where you have, you know, maybe a sudden change in your function or something like that. I can send you that paper. I have no idea if any of that would be applicable for integration, so I don't know. And what dimension? I mean, the examples they showed in the paper, I think, were mostly two-dimensional, I guess, because it's easy to show in the paper. Um, I think the method works in higher dimensions, but I don't know how fast it is if you have very high dimensions. But width is not excessively large in dimension, is it? I don't know. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you said that's probably a no, small problem, but yeah, but for us, so yeah, it's quite. No, what I'm saying is that it depends on it's the It's not one or two. <laughs> yeah, so it depends on the English one. Yeah. I expect you not fully. Uh, Band space. Bigger, so trust the whole picture. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, oh, no, sorry, the band, yeah, right. That, that's, uh, it, they, I mean, so. Is this multi channel? Normal multi channel? I mean, you. Yeah. You know that uh, certain diagrams have certain characteristics, like the huge structure there, and whatever. The other one has a little bit cheap, or different, and go on that give away according to that. But all the big ones can't do that. Yes, but uh, if it's using Vegas, then uh, it's sort of quite easy to test it. And you can't do that. Or no, I mean, this is just plug and play, but. No, no, I mean, so you do this, you, you map out, you know, yeah. all the propagated yeah. structures that you have. Uh, but then you still, you know, you, so you have a new set of variables yeah. and you get over those. And that's still done with Vegas at this point. There may be better ways to do it. There will not be ridiculously big peaks in it, but it's also not completely bad. Yeah. Now, what topic do you want to discuss? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. you mentioned, or you kind of asked this question about the liquid function. Uh, that's the way the future will go with the analytical calculation. We have at least two uh, 
more than two experts in the audience. So do you have a feeling of, of this correlative function for the future, or are we going to go beyond them and go hyper or is it <laughs> <laughs> or Uh, 
and you just have this fucking for one dimension. I always try to think of a way to do it. <laughs> Unfortunately. But uh, the tail or some interpretation. Nobody has come up with my No, it exists. They exist, but they don't work well. It's also obvious how to do Right. Um, hopeful note, but nevertheless, that's a good point to stop this discussion. So I thank all the panelists and all the. Uh,